In Formula One, the development race between the teams never stops. And what we've seen in the first two races was just the beginning of the fierce battle that plays out back at the team's factories. Hello everyone, I'm Julia Pique here joined by Motorsport.com Editor-in-Chief Charles Bradley. So how do the 10 teams stack up on pure pace? Using our super time data from Motorsport Stats, we can compare the performance of the cars across the season without the length of the circuits confusing the data. Charles, could you briefly explain to our audience how we're able to do that? Yeah, I'll keep it simple. It's quite easy, really. It's a uh, performance index that was formulated by uh, former Jordan designer Gary Anderson, actually. And it basically takes the fastest lap of each car across a race weekend. Usually that's qualifying, whether it's Q3, Q2 or Q1, if you're one of the back market teams. Mm -hmm. And then we work that out as basically a percentage of uh, relative to the fastest car. So let's say the Ferrari is quickest. That is 100%. That stays 100% at each event. And then each car is on a percentage further back. And then we take the mean of that and add that up across the season and you can tell exactly where the, uh, the the pace differential is between those all the cars. So meaning you could accurately compare a circuit like Austria's short Red Bull ring with Spa which is the longest on the calendar uh, in a way that just isn't possible if you were just comparing the time gaps between the cars. Exactly. Now remember the the 107% qualifying rule that was introduced in the 90s well that was based on the same data. So, with the number crunching explained, let's see how the teams stack up two races into the season. And at the bottom of the pile, it's no surprise to see Williams, which has fallen back from its average deficit of 3.6% across the entire 2018 season. Uh, the team had to make some last minute adjustments to its car to ensure its legality for the Australian Grand Prix. And now it must focus on fixing the fundamental problems that have put it so far behind. Adding downforce and reducing weight are understood to be the two priorities that need addressing on the FW42. On to number nine, and racing points progress in this table will be interesting to follow through the season, as right now the team is behind due to a lack of investment last year before it was taken over by the new owners. The team said it had a vanilla car for testing, then brought a major update package to Australia. But it was always expecting Bahrain to be a tough race, and that proved to be the case as it slipped to the back of the midfield uh, on pure pace. Now, Renault's position in our ranking clearly shows how a team's underperformance can be exposed by the Super Times data. The team is yet to make it to Q3 on a Saturday, and in Australia, it was only the ninth fastest car. Things were looking better in race trim in Bahrain until that shocking double retirement, but even that upturn in speed was only enough for Renault to be seventh fastest car out there as it again struggled to get its cars running properly in qualifying, and it still sits just eighth in our ranking for the season. Charles, this was supposed to be the year that Renault broke away from the midfield, but so far we're not seeing any evidence of that happening. So is that a cause for concern? Yeah, absolutely. Can you imagine what Daniel Ricciardo's thinking right now? He's come from the third best car and we're looking at right down the sort of in, in Australia, the ninth, ninth quickest car. Um, so he's gone from being spoiled at Red Bull to a team that's really struggling to find its feet at the moment. The target for this year for Renault is to be fourth, but as team boss Cyril Abitbull says it wants to be a better fourth because last year it was a long way back from the big three but this year started even worse than, than previously so there's a lot of big investment there not least in Ricciardo getting him on board so there's no excuses from the driving side at the moment but in terms of the investment that's been put into that team we need to see some better results and on raw pace at the moment that car is really struggling. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, how they evolve throughout the season. Mm -hmm. uh, continuing down our list, and Daniel Kvyat's stunning Q1 lap in Australia was enough to place the team seventh on the opening weekend. But a mix-up with his tires in qualifying in Bahrain meant the team potentially left some time on the table and was only the eighth fastest car. Now, the midfield battle is incredibly close, and Toro Rosso is vulnerable to falling behind Renault. Now, there is so little between those two teams. But as we'll see from the rest of the numbers, there's a little split between the teams at the front of that battle and Toro Rosso leading the chasing pack. 
Now, McLaren and Alfa Romeo have occupied the fifth and sixth places on this list at both the first two races, and right now it's the British team that holds a small advantage. Alfa Romeo can be happy with how it has started the 2019 season, though, as Sauber last year, the team had the seventh fastest car and its pace deficit was 2.6%. So to have that down to 1.7% so far this season uh, make marks a big step forward. Charles, is it a surprise to see McLaren as high as fifth in this table, given they ended 2018 with the ninth fastest car? Yeah, it kind of is and it isn't really. I mean, they should never have had the ninth fastest car last year. That was amazing how such a big team has fallen from grace. Right now, I think they're exactly where I think they should be. I think, you know, they've got two great drivers, two great young drivers. They're clearly pushing very hard. Uh, one thing I liked in Bahrain was the fact that they brought this barge board there developments to the track just you know race number two and they're bringing quite a large piece as, as a development so it shows that their aerodynamic teams really pushing hard so the front edge of this uh, of this barge board is completely new here and all the small fins as well so i think they get a really good handle on what their airflow is doing across the car and i think that's just going to show why their raw pace is coming up and up so uh, for each race so far so Cars in Q3 at both events, that's exactly where they need to be. Yep, and an incredible start for rookie Lando Norris as Indeed. well. Yep. Renault's shaky start to the season has left Haas clear at the front of the midfield, at least in terms of the ultimate speed of the car. And it's doing such a good job that it's not that much slower than the Red Bull Honda at this stage. Uh, now, Red Bull's deficit to the front has been almost identical at the first two races, which bucks the trend we saw from most teams in Bahrain as the rest of the field closed up to the front. Charles, all the attention preseason was on the Honda engine, but now it seems Red Bull has some work to do on its car to get back in terms with Ferrari and Mercedes. Yeah, quite amazing to think that Honda isn't the, the part of the equation that we're talking about here. It's actually, you know, that just the, the downforce and the stability of the car is just lacking here. They've always been, since, since the new rules in 2017, I've always felt that they're a little bit slow starting Red Bull. They don't seem to come out with a, with a cracking car straight away. They develop really well as the season goes ahead. And this is very similar to what we've seen uh, previously last, last year. But I think this year they're even further behind than where they were at this point last year. So they've got a lot of work to do. They did, did some good times in uh, testing this week. They seem to push really hard to try and uh, identify what the problem is but I don't think they're going to have a solution in time for China and I think it's not before uh, Barcelona that in the U European season that we're going to see them actually uh, get back and you know start chasing the, the big two. Yeah well speaking of the big two um, now we reach the battle for supremacy at the front where Mercedes and Ferrari have set the pace at one race each. Mercedes dominance in Australia was exaggerated by Ferrari underperforming but the prancing horse turned things around in Bahrain to give us a competitive picture that looked similar to what we expected from preseason testing. Now, Charles, Ferrari didn't get the results its speed deserved in Bahrain, but did we at least see a more accurate representation of how the red and silver cars compare over that weekend? Yeah, I think absolutely we did. And it, as you say, it was just like we saw in the Barcelona testing that the Ferrari seems to have a couple of tenths advantage and that manifested itself in Bahrain. Looking historically at it, again, the upcoming races in China and Baku, Ferrari were fastest there as well last year. So in the sort of ebb and flow of things, these are tracks that Ferrari historically go well at. Yeah. Uh, we've already seen quite a few uh, changes on the development side as well. Mercedes had uh, quite an interesting cooling change for Bahrain where they actually closed one of the, uh, the vents, as you can see here, uh, behind the, the halo. So it seems like they're not having the cooling problems. Remember in Australia, Ferrari seemed to have this cooling problem. Yeah. So Mercedes don't seem to have any worries on this front. They also bought a, a rear wing as well, which had different strikes along the uh, along towards the trailing edge of that wing. And Ferrari seem to be concentrating on their brake system. So with the ban on blown axles, they're trying to replicate that effect of airflow going across and out of the uh, the outside of the, the wheel. Remember, they're always trying to ban this sort of outwash air, but Ferrari is still trying to create it in a slightly different fashion. So they're using their brake drum to grab it from the inside, push it across the front of the drum, and then outside of the wheel that way, which, which isn't 
contravening any rules, but it's just trying to replicate that, uh, that uh, uh, airflow that they had before. So it's really interesting to see how this development race will run and run, and they'll just keep pushing on every front they can to try and uh, get that little tiny advantage and, and redress these uh, small percentage differences that we can see in our list. Absolutely. Well, that's how the teams stack up so far in 2019. Again, we'll be reviewing how the order changes on a regular basis this season. So make sure you join us to keep up with the F1 tech race. I'm Julia Piquet. This is Charles Bradley, and we'll see you next time.